Welcome back, everyone, in this new teaching moment. This one is all about express entry and that confusing situation when you have a Canadian spouse and you're going through express entry versus the sponsorship process. How do you enter this information in to your express entry profile? How do you do it in such a way that you don't have to create and, you know, and locate and find all of the supporting documents that typically you would be required to submit if your spouse was not a Canadian citizen. So Alicia is here joining me. She's the expert. Alicia put together a wonderful blog post entitled, If My Spouse is Canadian, Should They Be Listed as Accompanying or Non-Accompanying in My Express Entry Profile? And that is what we're going to talk about today. So Alicia, are you ready for this? Absolutely. I was hoping that we would save people from going down into a rabbit hole of confusion and express entry. So this is why I created this blog and we wanted to go through step by step and give a little video to show people what do we mean? How do you deal with this when you're actually looking at your express entry application itself? So before we get there, we'll talk about are you married or are you in a common law relationship? So this is going to be a circumstance where the principal applicant is the foreign national and they are doing their express entry application and they're married or in a common law relationship with somebody who's Canadian. And legal marriage, most people know when they've been legally married, I would hope. <laughs> yeah, they do. They have, they have a civil ceremony. Sometimes they also have a religious ceremony. And that's the only thing that's occasionally confusing. Sometimes there's a civil ceremony and a religious ceremony. And it's really important for express entry that people are gathering their document to prove that they've had a legal marriage. And that's the one that's been properly registered, not just the license, but the marriage certificate. So legal marriage, if you're legally married to a Canadian, that's pretty straightforward. Common law is a little bit more complex because that definition of common law spouse means somebody with whom you've cohabitated continuously for 12 months in a conjugal relationship. So if you've been together with somebody already for 12 months who's a Canadian citizen or permanent resident, then yes, you would say, yes, you are in a common law relationship with a Canadian. All right. Next topic. Is your Canadian spouse accompanying or non-accompanying, Alicia, when you're trying to set up your express entry profile? Yeah. They're so here in Canada, is... right? Like they're here in Canada, so clearly they're accompanying, right? Well, sometimes yes <laughs> and sometimes no, right? So there's circumstances where the Canadian spouse goes overseas, meet somebody abroad, and then, you know, people are working and living overseas, and then they decide, well, maybe we'll move back to Canada. And of course, the Canadian can come back to Canada, but the whole trick is, can their spouse come back? And if they've decided, well, maybe they don't want to do the spousal sponsorship route because the processing times are so long right now, maybe that principal applicant, the foreign national spouse, has a high CRS, and maybe they want to do an express entry application. So what happens if the Canadian and the principal applicant, let's say they're living in the US. And the principal applicants looking at the express entry profile, and they plan to both come back to Canada. So most of the time, people would just read that question, is your Canadian spouse going to accompany you to Canada? Right. They figure, sure, sure they are, they're going to come back Clear. with me. And that's where everything goes off the rails. So what do we do? What is an accompanying or non-accompanying spouse? And we'll pull up your blog post so people can, uh, can kind of follow along with us. Absolutely. So the key to figuring this out is actually realizing that the definition of an accompanying spouse is laid out in the ministerial instructions respecting the express entry system. So if you go to the definitions and you look up, well, under express entry, Ministerial instructions, the definition of accompanying spouse or common law partner means, so in respect of the principal applicant, who's the foreign national, means the foreign national spouse or common law partner who is accompanying him or her to Canada, and this is the kicker, and is not a Canadian citizen or a permanent resident. So if we unpackage that and we just kind of dig through the legalese here, what that means is that if you have, if you're married or in a common law relationship with a Canadian citizen or permanent resident, then the answer to is your spouse accompanying you to Canada is always going to be no. That makes it super easy. 
why is it not more easily explained <laughs> to everybody by IRCC? That's the I don't, question, right? I don't know. I looked. I looked for information on IRCC's website. I looked on the program operational instructions. I could not find anything about this. But when you go back to the ministerial instructions, that's where it's laid out. So that's why we're doing this video. All right. But the, yeah. So the next question is, well, how do you still declare your spouse? Because, of course, everybody knows, Mark and I talk about this all the time, it is absolutely essential not to misrepresent. You have to tell the truth, the whole truth, when you're doing your express entry application. So how do you still declare your spouse properly? Make sure that IRCC kn knows that you're married and what your spouse's details are. But how do you avoid going down the rabbit hole of saying that you thought they were accompanying and having to get all sorts of language tests and education credential assessments and work history for your spouse when you're never going to get points for it and, in fact, you don't need to have that information if they are a Canadian citizen or a permanent resident. Yeah. And it's interesting, Alicia, because if we go, we'll flip back over here to the actual portal. So this is my account here. And as you're going through when you're creating, so we'll click on here, apply for express entry. The system, we've spent a lot of time, you guys, going through this over and over again, Alicia and I trying to sort out exactly what selecting one thing versus another is really doing. And if you go through and you complete the eligibility for your Canadian experience class application, it doesn't even ask if your spouse is Canadian or not, which is so strange. But it does if you are answering the questions in such a way that you're eligible for the federal skilled worker. So we're going to approach it from that standpoint. So I'm just going to fill this in. I'm going to say I'm in Alberta here. And then it's asking about language tests. Yes, I've completed one. I'm, I did it just at the beginning of this year. We know it needs to be valid for two years or less. And then, oh, I'm a rock star. Solid scores on this one, Alicia. Um, not everybody can get it, I know, but I'm just so special with my abilities in English. In all honesty, I don't even know if I would score perfect scores. You know, I'm not a super fast reader, and I think sometimes that reading comprehension factors in. Okay, so no other tests for me. And then it says here, in the last three years, how many years of skilled work experience have you completed in Canada? So I'm going to say none because we want to push this to FSW. So we'll leave it. We'll say none of the above. And then now we're into the world of the Federal Skilled Worker Program, which for whatever reason is the only place where it really asks whether or not your, your spouse is a Canadian citizen. So I'll say yeah. I've got three years of work experience and uh, no trade experience. And that's just trying to classify if you uh, should be considered under the Federal Skilled Trade Program. But we'll stick with FSW. Yeah. Okay, then how much money do you have? Oh, we'll say I've got lots of money here. How many family members? Let's say three. Let's say I'm married and have a child. And then we'll go next here. Okay, do you have a valid job offer? We'll say no. And then finally, what is your date of birth? Okay, I'll just throw a birth date down. I wish I was 83. Boy, that'd be good. You mean born in 1983, not actually yeah, 83, right? Exactly, born in 83, yes, yeah. All right, and then my education, I'll say I've got a master's degree. Okay, so now it's asking questions, further questions that relate to the Federal Skilled Worker Program. For all of these, I don't really, it's not even important. I know I've got enough points with what I have. Now, what is marital status? So I'm married. So I'm going to select that. But Alicia, we have other options here. So what it's are true. these? Maybe you can yes. help people just understand what these mean. Yeah. So again, married, you're legally married to your spouse. Legally separated would be if you were previously married and now you're going through a separation process in family courts. Divorced is if that separation and divorce process, you've got a final certificate of divorce. And the annulled marriage would be if you were married, but for some reason your marriage was deemed not to have been valid right at the beginning. So it was annulled. There were grounds for that annulment and it actually occurred. Widowed, unfortunately, is if your spouse has passed away, they are deceased. And then common law is what we were speaking about before, 12 months continuous cohabitation in a marriage-like relationship. And you can't count anything before those 12 months have actually elapsed. So you have to actually be at the 12 month mark. Never married single is just what it says. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so I'm choosing married and I'm gonna go next here. 
Okay, now, does your spouse or partner plan to come with you to Canada? This is the question of all questions, Alicia. So what are we going to answer here? So let's pretend that we got it wrong, right? Let's pretend we were living in the U.S. and we thought, hey, my spouse is coming with me to Canada. My spouse is Canadian, but I know they're going to relocate with me and I'm a, fe- a foreign worker or I'm a foreign national. Maybe they're a U.S. citizen. So maybe they said yes. And if they said yes, it's going to populate all of the information for the spouse. If they say no, and that answer should be no, right? Because we just looked at what is the definition of an accompanying spouse. So even if your spouse is Canadian, and even if they're actually physically coming with you, because the legal definition is that an accompanying spouse cannot be Canadian spouse, then we're going to put no. So the correct answer would be no. Is your spouse or common law partner a citizen or permanent resident of Canada? If they are, and this is what we're talking about today, then you absolutely say yes. Yes. And then we click next here. Now it says, has your spouse taken an English or French? This is one that neither Alicia nor I can figure out why it's prompting this. So... Because you won't get points, right? So there's different tables. You guys know this from looking at Mark's other videos. There are, there's a table for what the CRS breakdown is if you are applying with a spouse. And there's one for if you're applying without a spouse. And even on the table itself, it does say at the top of that table, if your spouse is Canadian, treat this as though it's a single applicant uh, or somebody who doesn't have a, a spouse. So I don't know why they're asking for language test results for the spouse. You don't have to run out and get your Canadian spouse to do language exams, people. (laughs) So don't go through the added hassle of trying to pay for IELTS or SELPIT for your Canadian spouse or one of the French exams. It's not required. So just say none to this question. Okay, let me go next. And it says... You do not appear to be eligible for express entry. Well, that's interesting. I wonder what we answered. I wonder what we answered. This is the beauty of this process. Maybe with my age, when I, and this is the, the fun part. You guys can ignore this. The reality is, I think maybe the age that I chose, um, uh, maybe I, I lost too many points when I put that in there. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I only selected three years of foreign work experience. That's probably what happened. So um, anyways, you can ignore this. Uh, at the end of the day, that, understand that's how you complete it. And, and so it's really strange here that it's now prompting to do this. So let's just fill this out quick. We'll just follow this through. Um, and uh, so I do have January 1983. Interesting. Okay. So we'll go back to married here and you'll see what pulls up here. Company to Canada. Um, no is what we want here. They're not accompanying us to Canada. Then we go next. Okay, that's really strange because it said, you can see, this is where the system has all kinds of funny glitches. So it said, no, you're not eligible, but yet it still pushed us through. Yes, express entry is crazy. So the moral of the story is your Canadian spouse is a no. They are not accompanying you. Now, let's, Alicia, we're going to jump back here to the next portion. So if we go here, how to amend it. So let's say I selected yes. And in the course of doing that, um, it populated all of the information for my spouse. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull back a a little dummy account that we've previously created. And uh, right here, we'll flip back. So let's say you've answered yes. And now you've got your spouse here in the profile. And it's asking all of this information here. And you realize after watching this video, oh my goodness, I should have, I should have uh, listed that my spouse um, is non-accompanying. How do you, how do you fix this, Alicia? Yeah, because it looks like you can't change it. It looks like it's set in stone, yeah. but it is possible to change it. So in this scenario, you are the principal applicant. So Mark is the principal applicant. He's the foreign national. His spouse, Deanna, is Canadian citizen, and he realizes after watching this video wait a minute, I don't need to spend hours and hours and hours having to fill in the personal details, the study and languages, the work history for Deanna because she's she's unaccompanying according to immigration's definition. So what you do is you go back to, if you look at the top bar there, it says modify family information. So click that. 
And yes, this principal applicant's information, let's say, is still fine. Marital status is married. That's still correct. But go Marital back and here's the question. Will this person accompany you to Canada? The correct answer, if your spouse is Canadian citizen or PR, should be no. So if you change that to no and then click next. Dun, 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 dun. Then, and when you look back, <laughs> it takes off the Canadian spouse. You don't have to go through all that work of trying to put together your Canadian spouse's life history. But do be careful if you're looking at federal skilled worker, your spouse is still taken into consideration as a member of your family group. So in our little scenario, we said that there was a husband, a wife, and a child. And you've got to meet the settlement funds for a family group of three. So that's really important. Keep in mind that even if your spouse is a Canadian citizen or a permanent resident, if you're doing federal skilled worker, then you have to make sure that you have the settlement funds for all three people. Even if they're not immigrating with you, they're still part of your family unit and they also still have to be properly declared here. So their name, their birthday, and also their family members all have to be inputted eventually. Yes. And Alicia, can someone applying through Express Entry get points for the siblings of their Canadian spouse? So this is a good question too, because if somebody mistakenly thought, oh, I'm going to get adaptability points, right? I have a Canadian spouse and my Canadian spouse has a sibling that's living in Canada. I thought I could get 15 adaptability points. Well, no, you can't. You can't get those 15 adaptability points. You do have to declare your spouse's family members, parents, siblings, half siblings, step, step siblings, but you're not going to get those 15 adaptability points because when you look at the adaptability points for whether somebody's going to get 15 points for a spouse, a spouse's sibling, sibling. Mm -hmm. it says you can get 15 points for an accompanying spouse's sibling. And as we know, Canadian citizen or permanent resident spouses are not accompanying. So that's why. All right. Last but not least, those who have taken one step further and have now received their invitation to apply, their profile is locked, Alicia. Can yeah. they fix it? Yes. Yeah. So this actually happened on a client I was working with. They had gone on and they had gotten an invitation to apply and they were trying to figure out, well, this doesn't make sense. Why am I having to put all this information in for my Canadian citizen spouse? And it was still possible to go back, modify family information, change that are they accompanying to no, and that helped solve the issue. So it's never fear, it's still possible to amend, but be really, really careful if you have done this incorrectly and you're not sure what your CRS points were at the time that you got your invitation to apply. Because what happens is, if you thought that you had points that you didn't have, hopefully the system will have been smart enough not to give them to you. But somehow, you know, if you entered in all your Canadian spouse's language test results and things like that, make sure that your minimum eligibility score at the time was still what it needed to be to get that invitation to apply and it hasn't fallen below because you've changed things in your profile. Excellent. Well, this is great, Alicia. I think personally, this is going to save a lot of people a lot of hassle. And in the express entry course that I run, um, you know, this, I haven't seen this come up too frequently. Let's face it, it's quite rare. Usually when people are in Canada and they're made, married to a Canadian spouse or, or otherwise, Usually people consider um, the spousal sponsorship route, but there are some distinct advantages, at least when the world writes itself and they get back to processing times. Theoretically, express entry is supposed to go through almost six months faster than a traditional spousal. So that's why people often will consider um, going through this. Or maybe with their marriage um, or their common law relationship, they don't have a lot of supporting documents. And because of that, you know, the, the, the principal applicant, the foreign national uh, who's applying, maybe feels they have a stronger case going through express entry. So there are distinct opportunities um, where going through this route would make sense for someone. But uh, I think this will be a lot of help. And just to let everybody know, once again, Alicia has written a very detailed blog on this topic, and you can get it right on our, our website, Healthy 
www.thelawyerlaw.com. Go to our resources section, click on blogs, and you will see this one uh, amongst all of the other many, many blog posts we have on various topics within immigration. And this one right here, if my spouse is Canadian, should they be listed? You can click on here, get access. And at any time, if you're just confused and you're thinking, oh, I don't get this, we are always, always available. You can click on speak to a lawyer and book a consultation with Alicia right here or myself or one of the other lawyers in our firm. Super easy to do that. And uh, hopefully this was helpful for everyone. Any last thoughts, Alicia, before we wrap this one up? I think the very last thought, the other thing that trips people up is a spouse's work experience. So if you're only claiming, you know, the principal applicant is the only one getting points and the spouse is not a Canadian, then, you know, be careful. You don't have to go through all the the foreign national spouse's work experience if you're not going to get points for that. Exactly. The officers don't like their time being wasted, you know, in every way as much as, as people who are not wanting to waste their own time. So... Our job is to make their job easier. Thanks, Alicia. That's right. Okay. Thanks, Mark. That's it for today, guys. And uh, make sure you click on the description below. You can access the course right now as of June the 1st. It is going live, all designed to prepare you to be ready when those rounds of invitations start in July. And don't forget, every single course that is out there will connect with a corresponding masterclass. And the masterclass for this will be at the end of June to give you guys time to go through, review the material, and then come the end of June, there's going to be four hours of masterclass with me, live Q&As where you can ask me anything, and it's devoted just for the people that have subscribed for the June cohort. All right, guys, thanks so much, and we'll see you again soon.